Well, uh, two weeks ago in the uh, parable of the ten virgins, Jesus compared himself to a bridegroom for whose arrival his people are to be prepared. And last week in the parable of the talents, Jesus compared himself to a master to whom his servants must give an account. And this week in the, the parable of the sheep and goats, Jesus is the king under whose judgment one day all people will come. In the ten virgins, if you like, Jesus is urging vigilance in his people. In the talents, he's urging diligence in his people. And now in the sheep and goats, he is urging benevolence in his people. The parable of the sheep and goats is the last recorded sermon Jesus preached in Matthew's Gospel. It brings to a conclusion what Bible scholars call Jesus' Mount of Olives discourse with his disciples, which begins back in chapter 24 and verse 3, when over the course of chapters 24 and 25, Jesus teaches them about his second coming. The final three chapters of Matthew 26, 27 and 28 deal with Jesus' passion, his resurrection and the great commission he's given, he gives to his disciples. So I've entitled this morning's sermon, Jesus' last sermon, the parable of the sheep and goats. Now, strictly speaking, the sheep and the goats is not a parable. Jesus is not telling an allegorical story. He's simply stating what will happen at the end of time. He is the Son of Man who will return in glory. He is the messianic king who will one day judge the earth. He will be seated on his glorious throne surrounded by the angels of heaven. However, he compares himself to the shepherd who at the end of a long day, minding his flocks, separates the sheep from the goats. And likewise, at the end of time, before the judgment seat of Christ, King Jesus will make a, a great division of people into two kinds, the saved and the lost. Therefore, for simplicity's sake, we will refer to the sheep and the goats as the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now I believe that, having looked at it, that this parable has been widely misunderstood. Some have sought to divorce it from the gospel of grace altogether. And they stress the humanitarian nature of Jesus' words. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And they say that, that Jesus is painting a picture of how the world should be. Jesus is the great humanitarian encouraging his followers to create to a brotherhood of man just like others after him have also tried to do. This for instance, is the last verse of John Lennon's famous song, Imagine. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the world sharing. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only way one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. And they say that Jesus is teaching something similar. He's calling for a utopia where there will be no needy people. There are no hungry, thirsty or impoverished people lacking the necessities of life. There are no homeless people because they are offered hospitality. There are no uncared for people because they are given care. Even those in prison are not left to languish in their cells, but receive regular visits. But this is a fallacy. Jesus is 
not calling for the establishment of a perfect society here in Matthew's Gospel. He's simply teaching what will come to pass when he returns to judge the whole earth. Now, I have to admit, I have struggled these last few days to understand exactly what Jesus is getting at. And this parable, I've concluded, must not be read in isolation from the two parables immediately preceding it. There's a good deal of overlap between all three of them. The parables of the ten virgins and the talents also deal with division, just like we have here in the sheep and the goats. In the ten virgins, the five sensible girls are divided from the five silly ones. The five sensible girls accompany the bridegroom into the wedding banquet, whereas the five silly ones are shut out of it. And last week in the talents, the two faithful servants are divided from the faithless one. The two faithful servants receive their master's commendation and are rewarded with more responsibility, whereas the faithless servant is condemned for his negligence and then is promptly sacked. In both parables, however, at the beginning, everyone looked the same. They were just ten virgins. They were just three servants. They all looked the same until, that is, the moment of testing came. And here in the sheep and the goats, before the separation by the shepherd, at the beginning, all the animals looks, also look similar, as I understand sheep and goats in the Middle East often tend to. Unless the shepherd looks carefully, he's in danger of getting his sheep mixed up with his goats. Now this, I think, is important to understand when interpreting the parable and the, the cast of characters. Well, let's go through the cast list then and assign to each cast member the identity that they represent. Firstly, in verse 32, you've got all the nations will be gathered before him. Who do all the nations represent? Well, some have argued that the nations are literally all the nations and that they're being judged by Christ according to how they treated the nation of Israel. I think that's a bit far-fetched. I think that is over-egging the pudding. All the nations, I believe, are representative of all those who profess faith in Christ. All the nations are all those who claim to be Christians. This interpretation coincides then with the previous two parables. The ten virgins and the three servants also represent professing Christians, some of whom are later to be found authentic and some bogus. The sheep then in verses 32 and verse 33 are the, the real Christians whom Christ at the end of time separates from the false. The goats, also 32 and verse 33, are the, the counterfeit Christians. Like goats, share some attributes with sheep in that they have four legs and a tail and look similar from a distance. The true Christian and the false one also share some attributes and also look similar from a distance. The time is coming when Christ will judge who is genuine and who is false. Then lastly in the cast list you have what Jesus says in verse 40 is the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. Or in verse 45, the least of these. Who are these people. 
Now, some Bible scholars would say these least of people represent a humanity in need. The argument is anyone who is in genuine need is Jesus' brother or sister. And this is what New Testament scholar William Barclay has written. This is one of the most vivid parables Jesus ever spoke. And the lesson is crystal clear that God will judge us in accordance with our reaction to human need. He then identifies the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters as representative of human need in general. I don't believe this is the case, however. In my view, the least of these brothers and sisters of mine represent all Christians, lowly as well as exalted, although it is the lowly Christians Jesus particularly has in his sights here. And we can be confident of this interpretation because at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus identifies his disciples as his brothers. Meeting the, the women fleeing from the empty tomb, Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Matthew 28 verse 10. Earlier in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is teaching the crowd uh, when someone interrupts him and says that his, his mother and brothers are nearby wanting to speak to him. But Jesus replies, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he says, here are my mother and my brothers. So Jesus is clear. Jesus identifies the least of, his, of these brothers and sisters of mine as Christians, his followers, his disciples, not mankind in general or a humanity in need. And this is hugely important, as we should go on to see. So hopefully with the right understanding of whom the, the cast of the parable represent, we can go on to interpret and apply the parable. I've got three headings and three lines of application for you. Firstly, Jesus will judge those who profess to be Christians by how they treat other Christians. If all the nations are to be understood as all those who profess faith in Christ, this is the measure they will be judged by. How did such people treat the least of these, the least of these Christians? Now there's an obvious question which arises here. What about the gospel of grace that Paul preaches in his letters? Are Jesus and Paul singing from two different hymn sheets? Paul seems to emphasize salvation by grace, for it is grace. By grace ye have been saved through faith, and this not of, from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. That famous two verses from Ephesians chapter 2. But here, here, all Jesus' emphasis seems to be on works, good works, feeding the hungry, befriending the lonely, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, and visiting the imprisoned. But there is no contradiction. There is no disconnect. You see, from the faith comes the works. The good works are the evidence of the saving faith. As William Hendrickson so memorably puts it, the good works of the sheep are the fruit, not the root of grace. The good works of the sheep are the fruit, not the root of grace. In other words, a believer's genuine faith is the source of his or her good works. And according to Jesus, where should those good works be carried out primarily? Well, among God's people, 
as Christians love one another and serve one another with practical deeds of kindness. In a few days' time in the upper room, Jesus will go on to say to his disciples, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And Paul will go on to reinforce Jesus' teaching in John's Gospel in his letter to the Galatians. So he writes this, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Why is there all this New Testament emphasis on Christians loving one another and serving one another? Well, the reason is simple. There is no greater witness to the outside world if Christians do. As the early church grew in the second and third centuries, the outside world stood in amazement. And the church historian and theologian, Tertullian, captured how the world reacted in his writings. And this is what he said. Look. How these Christians love one another and how they are ready to die for each other. So Jesus judges all those who profess faith in him by how they have treated other Christians. But not just other Christians who are their equals, but how they have treated the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. It's one thing to offer hospitality to those who can return the compliment. It's quite another to offer hospitality to those who cannot. It's one thing to open your homes to people who make for good company and lively conversation. It's quite another to open your homes to those who are needy and who will consume a lot of your emotional resources. But needy people people with lots of problems, people with baggage. They're exactly the kind of people Jesus has in mind when he speaks of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. You know, a, a test of true godliness is how you treat the person in church who is least able to be of benefit to you. If you treat him or her with kindness and respect, that's godliness. If you treat him or her with disdain, that's fleshliness. I heard an interview given recently by some family members of the late pastor and Christian writer Derek Prime on this godly man's life. And they said it didn't matter who you were in the church Derek Prime pastored in Edinburgh. He treated everyone the same, the lowest and the highest. He treated them with consideration, kindness and respect. He didn't discriminate according to anyone's social standing. He was even handed. You know, Jesus then will judge those who profess to be Christians by how they treat other Christians. That's the first point. Secondly, in verses 37 and 39, Jesus will surprise those he identifies as his sheep. You know, verses 34 to 40 are among some of the most moving verses in all of scripture. Jesus says to the sheep, you fed me when I was hungry. You gave me something to Drink when I was thirsty, you befriended me when I was lonely, you clothed me when I was naked, you cared for me when I was ill, you visited me when I was in prison. The sheep, however, scratched their heads. 
They look at Jesus, the, the judge, with puzzled faces. They stare at him in bewilderment and wonder what on earth can he be talking about. And three times, in three verses, they ask the same question of him. When did we see you in need? And then Jesus movingly identifies himself with the least of his brothers and sisters in his kingdom, verse 40. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I like the way the message puts it so vividly. I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Can you imagine the sheep's surprise when they hear Jesus's, when Jesus say those words? They're taken aback. They're stunned. They're astounded at what he has said. But why are the sheep so surprised? Because the sheep are so unassuming. Because they are so modest. They thought so little of it. They simply got on with serving. They had so self-effacingly dedicated their lives to the service of the saints. Their service to the saints had become part and parcel of their lives. It became, for the sheep, the natural way to live, to think of others before they thought of themselves. It became their default position to serve others, and especially their brothers and sisters in Christ. The sheep are surprised that their little acts of kindness to the little people in God's system, which they thought were of little consequence, were actually a big deal to Jesus. William Hendrickson writes this, it is Christ's unpretentious but sincere follower who honours him in the common things of life that is here pronounced blessed. The astonishment expressed by these followers of the Lord was that born of service spontaneously, gladly, gratefully and humbly rendered and then completely forgotten. You know, the Pharisee in us keeps count. The Pharisee in us keeps score. The Pharisee in us keeps a mental account of all the good deeds we do and to whom. But the sheep whom Jesus commends in this parable simply do good works and then forget what they have done and go on to the next good work without giving it a thought. Good works have become so integral to the sheep's lives they do not have to think about it. They forget them. And here's the wonderful thing. But Jesus, the judge, doesn't. He sees them, he remembers them, and one day will reward them. So Jesus will judge those who profess to be Christians by how they treat other Christians. Jesus will surprise those he identifies as his sheep. And thirdly, Jesus will shock those he identifies as the goats. If verses 34 to, 30 to 40 are among some of the most moving verses in the Bible, verses 41 to 45 are among some of the most disturbing. You have religious people being classed as goats by Jesus the judge. You have people who profess to believe in Christ being condemned to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. How do we know that they claim to be Christians? Well, verse 44 tells us. They address Jesus, the judge, as Lord. This verse reminds us of the verse towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus reveals that not everyone who addresses him as Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who are obedient to his Father's will in heaven. And those whom Jesus identifies as goats are shocked because they're familiar with Christian terminology and they use Christian vocabulary. They say Lord frequently. 
but it won't be enough to save them before the judgment seat of Christ. They're shocked because they claim to belong with the sheep. They're shocked because they claim to believe what the sheep believe. They're shocked because they've been baptised or confirmed as the sheep have been. They're shocked because they've been received into church membership as the sheep have been. They're shocked because they have sat for years under the ministry of faithful teachers of God's word, just as the sheep have also sat under. On the surface, the goats look like the sheep. But it's Jesus the judge who delves under the bonnet and says, depart from me, you who are cursed. Jesus says to the goats, you didn't feed me when I was hungry. You didn't befriend me when I was lonely. You didn't clothe me when I was destitute. You didn't lift a finger to help me when I was in prison and was ill. And shocked. The goats asked Jesus, when did we see you in need but did not help you? And the implication of their question is this, Lord, if only we had known it was you, we would have helped you. If only you had said who you were, we would have gone out of your, our way to provide for you. But Jesus isn't interested in if onlys. Again, he identifies himself with the least and the lowest in the kingdom. You didn't show compassion to the least and lowest in the kingdom, so you didn't show compassion to me. Whereas the sheep had been undiscriminating in their good works, the goats had been extremely picky. We're not told that the goats did anything particularly evil. Probably they'd been faithful to their spouses. Probably they'd been caring of their families. Probably they had been respectable citizens in their countries. But it was all about what the goats hadn't done. It was all about what they had failed to do. It was about the real need they had seen among the least in the church of Jesus Christ but had turned a blind eye to. The goats were guilty not of the sins of commission but the sins of omission. The sin of not doing the good which was in their power to do. The sin of neglect. The sin of indifference to brotherly and sisterly need. The goats were guilty of a doing thing, Christianity. They claim they had faith, but they lacked the works of compassion to substantiate their claim of faith. Our verse for the week states, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But the goats are not God's handiwork. And although there are always plenty of opportunities for good works, the goats decide on a self-serving life rather than on a sacrificial one of serving other Christians. Jesus said to, to round off his, his teaching on the second coming, well, he ends, doesn't he, with these three parables. In the ten virgins, he calls for vigilance in his people. In the talents, he calls for diligence in his people. And in the sheep and the goats, he calls for benevolence in his people. Jesus will judge those who profess to be Christians by how they treat other Christians. Jesus will surprise those he identifies as his sheep. And their surprise will be a pleasant one. But Jesus will shock those he identifies as the goats, and their shock will be a distressing one. 17th century French mathematician, physicist, philosopher, and theologian Blaise Pascal expresses it perfectly. The elect will be ignorant of their virtues, and the outcasts ignorant of the greatness of their sins. There will be then both Surprise and shock as Jesus judges the earth and separates the sheep from the goats. Jesus will judge purely on evidence. The question to be ascertained, writes J.C. Rowell, will not merely be what we said, but what we did. <laughs> 
Not merely what we professed, but what we practiced. And the sheep will be surprised their little deeds of kindness to the least of God's people, and which they thought so little of, are actually of great consequence in Jesus' sight. And the goats will be shocked that for all their pious language, their sins of omission actually condemn them in Jesus' sight. I will leave the last word to plain speaking James, who in his letter asks these two rhetorical questions. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Faith accompanied by deeds makes you a sheep, but faith without deeds makes you a goat. To the sheep here this morning, God's word says, keep loving and keep serving your fellow Christians and especially those who are least in the kingdom of God. Jesus the judge does not miss even a cup of cold water given on a hot day to a thirsty saint. If there are any goats here this, among us this morning, don't settle for a nominal Christianity. It won't save you, says God's word. Instead, show your faith by your deeds, for Christ's own name's sake. Amen.